Hey Seekers, what's up? Welcome back. I would like to tell you about a book. This book is one of the greatest philosophical works of all time. It was written in the 12th century by one of Judaism's greatest philosophical minds. It was the product of 15 years of intense intellectual labor, written to a single student, and to those who shared his struggle between faith and reason, religion, science, and philosophy. This book is a difficult and demanding one, written like a puzzle with its chapters intentionally out of order and riddled with contradictions, with its true meaning still vociferously debated today. Many throughout the ages have read it, but fewer have understood it. Those who did, however, including Aquinas, Spinoza, Leibniz, and Newton, discovered its secrets and integrated it into their lives and philosophies. This book, likely the greatest work of Jewish philosophy ever produced, grapples profoundly with questions such as the problem of evil, the fundamental nature of reality, the purpose and meaning of life, moving masterfully through a thousand years of Greek, Jewish, and Muslim philosophy before it, the author, with an astonishing reading of the Bible, goes on to radically redefine God, religion, and humanity in the process. It's no surprise that this book was immediately banned and burnt by religious authorities and went on to stir controversy for hundreds of years to come, perplexing the guided and guiding the perplexed. If you don't know what book we're speaking about already, today we'll be presenting Musa ibn Maimun's Dalalat al Ha'irin, the Rambam's Marinavuchim, Moses Maimonides, Guide for the Perplexed. In this series of Maimonides, we're exploring his life and philosophy and its relationship to mysticism. Up until this point, we've presented an overview of his life, works, and legacy, a survey of the reception of Maimonides amongst historians and scholars, something of a literature review and a lay of the land of the Maimonidean scholarship on the question of his relationship with mysticism. We spoke next about the need for us to clean up the uses of our language in this discussion, particularly the need to clarify the relationship and distinction between the words like Kabbalah and mysticism, rationalism and mysticism. It's now come to the exciting time to begin to present the philosophy of Maimonides itself. To do that, we're going to begin by introducing to you Maimonides' philosophical magnum opus, The Guide for the Perplexed. Truth be told, The Guide for the Perplexed is not a book, but a riddle, or rather, a book-length riddle. History has it that The Guide was written by Maimonides as a series of letters to a single student, a certain Joseph, the son of Judah, who had been forcibly converted to Islam during the Almohad invasion of the Iberian Peninsula, but had, like Maimonides, escaped to Egypt. Maimonides wrote the guide for Joseph and for those like him who found themselves torn between Aristotelian philosophy and Jewish theology, between reason and faith, and as a result were, as the title indicates, perplexed. Maimonides, the metaphysician, the doctor of the soul and spirit, felt the pain of their struggle, and from a place of deep love and concern for his people, wrote these letters in the hopes that it would bring them some solace and answers, even if he risked his entire legacy and career doing so, even for just one student. Maimonides completed the text in Cairo around the year 1190. Written in Arabic with Hebrew letters, the guide was really the first sustained attempt to interpret Judaism philosophically, and stands the test of time as both the most influential and the most controversial work of Jewish philosophy in the history of the people of the book. Drawing from Jewish, Islamic, and Greek philosophical sources, the guide addresses the core themes of the nature and existence of God, the origins, duration, and purpose of the universe, creation, revelation, and redemption, prophecy and providence, law and rationality, the problem of evil, free will, and divine omniscience, the meaning of life and human striving, all themes that are relevant to religion in general and not just to Judaism, and consequently went on to influence everyone from Albertus Magnus, Thomas Aquinas, Don Scotus, Raymond Martini, and Meister Eckhart, who besides for Aristotle and Augustine quotes Maimonides more than any other philosopher, to Spinoza, Leibniz, Newton, and James Joyce, and of course all subsequent Jewish philosophy and theology, including in the modern period people like Strauss, Buber, Rosenzweig, Fackenheim, and Levinas. The publication of Maimonides' Guide was met with considerable fanfare, being translated multiple times into a host of languages, but was also met with considerable resistance and controversy, particularly in Spain and southern France, where the book was burnt with cheirims and counter cheirims, bands and counterbands flying back and forth between its descenders and defenders. The battle over this book escalated to the point of it being handed over to the Dominican Inquisitors for public burning in southern France, December 1232. Those who hadn't lost their sanity in the debacle realized at this point that the debate had gotten far out of hand 
and produced an infighting which only whets the inquisitorial appetite for more Jewish book burnings. And, as we know, it is not long before those who burn books will burn the humans in whose minds those books took shape and residency. There's been a lot written on this sad saga, now referred to as the Maimonidean controversy. I'd rather not dwell on it, but provide some sources if you are interested in further reading and move on. Let us then give an overview of the content of the guide itself. The guide is broken into three books. The first book starts off with an analysis of anthropomorphic depictions of God in the Bible, passages which seem to indicate that God has some sort of bodily parts or functions, and attempts to prove why these verses must not be taken literally, but instead figuratively, accusing all who do read these texts literally as violating the severe biblical prohibition against idolatry. To read the Bible literally, in Maimonides' opinion, is not only to misread it, but to commit an act of high heresy. And it was to this cause of purging Judaism, of divine anthropomorphism, of the notion that God has a body, to which Maimonides devotes the first 70 chapters of the guide, no less. Next up, Maimonides argues that God cannot be described at all with human language, and that all we can say about God is what God is not, what becomes known as negative or apophatic theology, literally unsaying. He then goes on to throw some shade on Kalam theology for its literalism, and ends with some cosmological and teleological arguments for the existence of God. We're going to speak about all of this in much greater detail coming up in the upcoming series, God willing, but for now we're just presenting a brief overview and sketch of the book just to give us a sense of its general contours and direction. The second book of the guide begins with Maimonides' cosmological discussion of the creation of the world, presenting the Greek conception of the universe as comprised of a series of concentric spheres put into motion by God, the unmoved mover, and deliberates over Aristotle's proof for the eternality of matter, which posed a seeming contradiction to the rabbinic reading of the book of Genesis, in which God creates the world at a certain point of time out of nothing which Maimonides concludes, or at least seems to conclude, in favor of a belief in creation ex nihilo, as the rabbis read the Bible, God's creation of the universe out of nothing, over what he finds to be inconclusive proofs for an Aristotelian eternal universe. Maimonides then ends book two with a discussion about the nature of prophecy and angels. In the third and final book of the guide, the climax of the text, Maimonides gives a philosophical interpretation of the prophetic turned mystical vision of the divine chariot in the first book of Ezekiel, the Ma'asem Merkava as it's known, giving it, much to the chagrin of centuries of Kabbalists, what seems to be an Aristotelian or Neo-Aristotelian reading. Next, Maimonides provides a treatment of the problem of evil, one of the oldest and thorniest challenges to theology. Maimonides' solution revolves around the notion of free will, which leads him to a discussion of some other classic theological issues, like the perceived contradiction between free will and divine omniscience, the issues of divine providence, and a discussion of moments in the Bible where God tests humans, focusing on the biblical characters of Job and the binding of Isaac in the book of Genesis as key examples of God's foreknowledge and human's choice coming into focus and conflict. Up next, Maimonides categorizes and rationalizes the 613 commandments from the five books of Moses, dividing them into two camps, those between human and human, which aim to, in his opinion, improve society and the relations between people, and those between the human and God, which according to Maimonides aim to improve the human's moral and intellectual faculties. Maimonides ends the third book with a discussion of the perfectibility of human life, presenting a hierarchy for the individual to ascend from material perfection to bodily perfection to moral perfection, and finally intellectual perfection, in which one comes to know God and lastly, the ethical perfection which follows as a result from knowing God. Let us talk now briefly about Maimonides' philosophical sources. Maimonides' intellectual geography situates him firmly in the Islamic and Eleusian philosophical tradition. This tradition had its roots in Aristotelian thought, as it had been expressed and developed by Muslim thinkers like Al-Farabi in the 10th century, Ibn Bajjah, Ibn Tufayl, and Ibn Rushd in the 12th century. This intellectual situation within the Arabic Aristotelian tradition is evident in Maimonides' guide, in which he cites a host of Greek and Muslim philosophers, Aristotle, Alexander, Aphrodisias, Plato, Al-Farabi, and Ibn Bajjah, and shows his indebtedness to Ibn Sina and Al-Ghazali. His influence and relationship to this tradition shows as well in his letter to his translator Shmuel Ibn Tibbon, in which he gives his hot take on which philosophers are worth reading and which aren't. While not explicitly mentioned in the text, it's clear that Maimonides has been reading and was influenced by the Jewish philosophers that came before him, like Sajigurn, Yehuda Levi, Avram ibn Ezra, and Avram ibn Dawud. 
Insofar as his philosophy goes, Maimonides was, above all in his own self-conception and description, a philosopher in the tradition of Aristotle, a man whom Maimonides believed had reached the peak of human intelligence, writing in his letter to Ibn Tibbon that with the exception of those who had received divine inspiration, i.e. the prophets, Aristotle's intellect represents the highest peak of human intellection. For those of you who know your stuff and feel like we failed to mention one of Maimonides' most important philosophical sources, don't worry, we're going to add it to the mix in the upcoming class and see just how Maimonides' Aristotelianism gets a little or a lot more nuanced and mystical as a result. Maimonides' guide is often described as working towards a philosophical synthesis between Aristotelianism and Judaism, and we may even have indulged in that trope for the sake of simplicity in our introduction, but it's more accurate to frame Maimonides' philosophical project as Citron and Kellner do, not as an attempt to merge two distinct components that needed synthesizing, but rather as an attempt to bring to play two crucial aspects that were both critical for the development of the religious individual in their quest for God. With the belief that the deepest and most abstract thought of Judaism could be most clearly and accurately expressed in the vocabulary of the Aristotelianism, which Maimonides accepted as one of the highest expressions of the human spirit of his day. Rather than of thinking Maimonides' work as an attempt to reconcile Aristotelianism and Judaism, we can think of it as an attempt to find the highest, truest expression of both of them in ways that bring the individual together to the ultimate, to God. Following this logic, it is precisely a philosophical interpretation of Judaism which, for Maimonides, reveals the true meaning of the biblical text. Since the biblical narratives contain the divine truth, but those truths are veiled because the text is not written for philosophers, but for the masses, and therefore must be conveyed in a way that appeals to the average person. But it is the work of the philosopher, with their tools of logic and language, to unpack those narratives and reveal the truth hiding behind them like golden apples behind a silver lattice. And then take the gold, take the truth, and repackage it for their day for the perplexed of every age and generation. As Maimonides remarks in his introduction to the guide, the truths of the Bible are expressed in equivocal terms so that the masses might comprehend them in accordance with the capacity of their understanding and the weakness of their representations, the weakness of their capacity to think logically and abstractly, whereas the perfect person who was already informed will comprehend them otherwise, will comprehend the truths as they really are. Maimonides, as we began by saying, lays out his text as a puzzle and says as much in his introduction to the text, writing that a sensible person should not demand of me or hope that when we mention a subject, we will make a complete exposition of it. Rather, the subjects are scattered and entangled with other subjects that are to be clarified. Why, you may ask, would Maimonides intentionally make his text near impossible to read? Good question. For my purpose is, is that the truth be glimpsed and then again concealed, writes Maimonides. Maimonides then goes on to list seven types of contradictions that one may find in a text, and admits to making use of two of these types of contradictions, number five and number seven in his list, to purposely conceal the truths that he's trying to convey. Writing, know this, grasp its true meaning, and remember it well, so as not to become perplexed by some of these chapters. Thank you, Maimonides, for the warning. Maimonides puzzles his text because he believes that when one is teaching extremely obscure matters, to quote him, one must conceal some parts and disclose others for the necessity of teaching and making the reader understand, in accordance with the example of nature and the divine will, which does not reveal all at once, but rather conceals and reveals, as the biblical verse writes, Sayyid Hashem Lirei of the secret of the God is with those that fear him. Maimonides' style of authorship and teaching, as frustrating as it is, is in line with both Hebrew and Greek precedent, concealing the truth and challenging the reader to discover it for themselves, putting into motion an ever-giving, ever-bewildering text that continues to challenge readers up until this very day. As Kramer writes, the message of the guide is scattered throughout its chapters and the reader must pick up hints and join them to form a coherent account. Maimonides gave keys for unlocking its secrets throughout the text, he guided by illusion rather than by imparting an authoritative body of teaching, as Plato saw knowledge not as information transmitted from master to disciple, from teacher to pupil, but as a matter of being and thinking communicated through dialogue. The guide as a whole, writes Leo Strauss, is not merely a key to a forest, but is itself a forest, an enchanted forest, and hence also an enchanting forest. It is a delight for the eyes, for the tree of life is a delight to the eyes. 
Maimonides, by profession, was a doctor, a physician to the ailments of the body, and as such was compassionately committed to the reduction of human suffering. But the body is only half the picture. It's in the guide that we encounter Maimonides, the doctor of the soul, the healer of the ailments of the mind, Maimonides, the metaphysician. Maimonides' overarching prescription of the guide is to raise its perplexed reader above the fear-inducing superstitious religious beliefs of the masses to an equanimity of consciousness which comes from a rational and philosophically informed religious perspective on life, to lift them above the chaos and turmoil of everyday life to a mode of being characterized rather by order, restraint, moderation, and equanimity, a supreme remedy against the excesses of desire and passions, false standards, mass hallucinations, and extremism, a bid to cultivate a life of reason in harmony with nature, humbly abiding by ethical and religious precepts, with care for one's health, allowing for wholeness of body and mind as necessary for riding the waves of the tumultuous sea of life. Maimonides' desire is to impart a new vision of reality, one through which a process of philosophical exploration and self-transformation leads to a deep intellectual and spiritual serenity, opening up the doorways to enlightenment and tranquility. When these gates are opened, writes Maimonides, and these places entered, the soul will find rest, the eyes will be delighted, and the bodies will be eased of their toil. Maimonides guides the reader on the path of philosophy without threatening their religiosity, and shows how the two may even and must indeed support one another. Religion for Maimonides both instills morality by conveying the abstract truths of philosophy to the masses in the form of story and parable, images and symbols, rite and rituals, and imparts faith to carry us on when science and philosophy reach their limits, which they inevitably must, for the human mind is but finite, and the mystery of reality, whose traces shimmer in the harmonious beauty of nature, infinite. The guide steers us towards becoming fully human, by helping us find meaning and purpose in life through the perfection of human reason, the image of the divine within us, allowing us to live in alignment with wisdom, in line with the rich, therapeutic, philosophical traditions of the pre-Socratics, Plato, Aristotle, and the Stoics, Maimonides nurtured a philosophy which not only strove for mere knowledge, but for transformation, philosophy as a way of life, a life guided by the pursuit of and a love for wisdom. A philosophy which encourages us and emboldens us to properly appreciate the beauty of the cosmos, to meditate on those shimmering traces and experience the presence of the divine in every moment, wherever we may be, alone at night, traveling, or lost in nature beneath the stars above, that in every moment we may find ourselves lost, in the words of Maimonides, in a passionate love for God, in an amor die intellectualis, an intellectual love for God, as a deep admirer of Maimonides would put it centuries later, peering through his telescope back in time from his lonely attic in The Hague. For Maimonides, the very horizons of our reality may be nudged and expanded in those moments of love, in those revelations of beauty, like someone traveling in a dark night over whom flashes lightning time and again, writes Maimonides in the introduction to the guide, illuminating the mind, illuminating the universe. Maimonides, the foremost exponent of Jewish rationalism, convinced of the limitations of human reason, well aware that the mind often merely serves to justify what the heart and passions already want, compares the frail yet mighty human to one lost and fumbling in the darkness of the night, sporadically illuminated by the light of a bolt of lightning tearing through the sky, providing rare moments of illuminated clarity in which the entire landscape of reality is laid bare before us, clear as day only for the light to retrace its sinuous paths, receding, recoiling into the heavens, leaving us with the cold, dark reality, leaving us with our old ways and habits as we were before. But now, at least, we've glimpsed the light, and with the God-given power of our intellect, we can begin to reconstruct the revelation from the powers of our reason. It is this work of reconstructing revelation with the power of reason that Maimonides sets himself to in the guide, and the might, mystery, and grandeur that this book has held for centuries speaks volumes to the divine illumination captured therein. Maimonides was one of those rare humans, who was seemingly not only privy to the divine light, but one of the titans who was able to capture that lightning in a bottle. Join us as we shake that bottle once more and see what is left within it to illuminate our minds and enlighten our paths still today. Join us next week as we dive headfirst 
into the brilliant and blinding philosophy of Moses Maimonides. Thank you, all of you who joined us to learn again. Thank you to our patrons who allow us to continue doing this work so generously. If you can afford it, please do consider joining them to support this work. Join us next week as we begin to make our way directly in to the metaphysics and epistemology of Maimonides and see, perhaps, maybe just maybe, where his mysticism lies. If you haven't already, please do check out the videos made by our collaborators Justin and Philip over at their channels Let's Talk Religion and Esoterica. Much love, and as always, keep seeking.